In episode 124, we asked Lubosh Pastor if we should expect to see active managers outperform given the continued growth in the popularity of passive index investing. Yes, we should. The only question is when, but absolutely. So as money continues shifting from active to passive, what's going to happen is that it'll become easier for active managers to outperform. Right? If more and more people are dropping out, your competition is shrinking. At some point, if you're the only person out there picking low-hanging fruit, your, your alpha is going to be really high. right? So it's just a matter of when this happens. So I think as soon as we see a couple of years of um, outperformance, by active managers in aggregate, um, you know, it'll be a hint that perhaps we have achieved that equilibrium state of the world in which investors should finally be roughly indifferent between active and passive. For a long time, um, we've been in a state where active has been too big relative to passive, and that's why its alpha has been negative. Active has been underperforming because it's been too big, too competitive, too many people, too many skilled people doing all the good things. So what are the implications for investors? Like, should, should people be looking out for the time when active starts to outperform and then start shifting dollars away from passive? Or are, have we basically just arrived at the Grossman-Stiglitz paradox, where as soon as, that, as soon as that happens, the alpha goes away anyway? Yeah, I think I, what you said make, makes a lot of sense. Uh, I'm personally in index funds, and I'm waiting for that moment to arrive. And uh, when I do see a couple of years of outperformance by active, it'll be a sign that too much money has shifted from active to passive. Hmm. And at that point, I think more investors, perhaps myself included, will, will reason, okay, now I'm leaving alpha on the table. I'm going to move some money back into active. Does that, does that action by its nature, though, make the alpha go away again? Yes. In our model, that's precisely what happens. So in our model, what you get in that 2012 paper you mentioned, what you get is that alpha is inversely related to the, uh, the fraction of all money that's actively managed. So as that fraction grows bigger, alpha gets smaller. As that fraction shrinks, which is the case we're discussing, alpha gets larger. And, and equilibrium is achieved when there's a sweet spot, when there's just enough money invested in, in active management that alpha going forward is about zero. It should really be slightly positive to compensate investors for you know, the slight amount of risk um, in active management, I mean, residual risk. Uh, but as, if it gets close to zero, then investors will be roughly uh, indifferent between active and passive. In episode 200, we asked Gene Fama if the ongoing inflows to passive funds pose any potential challenges to market efficiency. Well, you, you can't have 100% of the money going into uh, passive funds because then there's nobody there to, you know, trade to make the market efficient. So the people who actually have information that other people don't have. Uh, you, you want them to stay in the, in the market and use that information. Uh, so the, the real question that nobody's never answered, ever answered is, how many of those people are there out there? How many does it take to make the market efficient? Mm -hmm. So most of the trading by these investors just offsets the, the dumb things that other active managers do. So <laughs> active management doesn't always make the market more efficient. Sometimes it makes it less efficient because people make bad bets. Um, so the, the, the informed people have to offset these uninformed people who make the, make the bad bets. So it takes more informed to offset the uninformed, the more uninformed there are. In episode 220, we asked Jonathan Burke and Jules Van Binsbergen what the evidence suggests about active manager skill. Oh, it's overwhelming. Active managers are highly skilled. Something like they add something like three million dollars. Average the average manager adds three million dollars a year. But there's an important caveat to that. On average, they add three million dollars a year, but the distribution is highly skewed. Most managers destroy value, hmm. but a few managers add an enormous amount of value. And the reason, of course, is that the skilled managers have all the money. So there, there are lots and lots of managers that are destroying value, but they're not managing much money. They're not doing a lot of damage, right? Most of the money is concentrated in highly skilled managers. No, and, and so I think the point Jonathan just brought up is, is also very important actually in the passive space, right? Sometimes you see people say statements like, the fact that there are passive funds that charge really high fees 
is evidence that markets are really mutual fund markets really are irrational and that there's a problem with them. But what we we cannot just look at funds on a fund by fund basis and then see how it's allocated. If we find out that the vast majority of money is allocated to the very large index funds that do it correctly, and yes, we can find a few where this allocation didn't optimally happen, that still means that there's overwhelming evidence in the direction that the capital is going to the places where it needs to go. Even if sometimes, yes, and I think Jonathan has some work on that, for the very worst performing funds, yeah, there is a little bit of evidence that people stick with those a little bit too long. I mean, that's old, that may also be true, but that doesn't mean that we should throw out the baby with the bathwater. Generally, the, large, the best managers get the most funds and therefore add the most value. I mean, look, the world is full of charlatans. The idea that we're going to get rid of all the charlatans in the world is a little naive. So the question is not, can I find a fund where there's basically a manager ripping off investors? Of course, you're going to be able to find a fund. You can find charlatan doctors. You can find charlatans in all areas of the economy. So that's not the interesting question. The question is, are those funds, are those charlatans large? Are they ripping off many investors? And the answer is definitively not. The vast majority of investors are in funds that are adding a lot of value. In episode 212, we asked Ralph Coyne which investors are most influential in setting prices and what would happen if they turned to passive index investing. Yeah, so so, so that's right. So, so one of the things that, that we've looked at is sort of like, um, suppose that uh, investors would get like in or out flows, like how much sort of would different types of investors um, uh, move prices? And what we find there is that the most sort of like impactful group uh, per dollar of assets that they manage is um, our hedge funds and, and small active uh, investment advisors. And so the intuition being is that that's kind of a combination of, of two things. Uh, one is uh, if you look at their active share, like how much they deviate from uh, the market, um, that is kind of a measure of how much they disagree with kind of consensus, if you want. Like think of the market as consensus, their demand is very different from consensus. And so if they experience outflows and someone else has to hold those stocks that they weren't really willing to hold before. Now, the second thing that happens is that um, if you look at the elasticity of different investors, then hedge funds are very price elastic. And so if they see like something that looks out of line with their, with their demand, they're very agile to sort of move in. Other investors are less agile. And so now if you if you pull money away from hedge funds, then other investors have to hold it, but they're less responsive to price. And so prices have to move a lot more for other investors to, to step in. And so if you combine the two things together that their demand is very different from what other investors want to hold, plus to convince the other investors that they ha have to hold these other securities, prices have to move more, their price impact per dollar that they manage is, is larger. What, what would happen if those most influential investors did switch to market cap indexing? Um, so, well, it mostly, yeah, so, so it mostly would lead to, and it's going to do two things. One is that uh, obviously it's going to be like repricing of, 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 of securities. The second thing is it would make the market more inelastic. And so, so because as, essentially like the elasticity of the whole market is evaluated average of the elasticity of each and every investor. And so if money moves away from the very elastic investors, um, then whoever is like left in the market is going to be less elastic. And any flow or any demand stroke that's going to happen is going to have a larger impact on, on prices. And so that's also where the whole debate about sort of like active versus passive is, 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 is kind of like a, a hard one to settle in the sense that like, if you want to sort of know whether like, like the, the growth in passive has made the market more elastic or, or not, it really depends on like where the money came from. Like if the money came from very sleepy buy and hold households who rebalance their 401k one, once every seven years, now uh, maybe it made the market actually more elastic if mm -hmm. they if they hold certain like like wow. strategies versus if they if it came from very agile hedge funds, it's a different story. We then asked Ralph about the pricing influence of Vanguard, well known as the pioneer of index investing and a current giant in the space. And how influential is a huge firm like Vanguard in setting prices? Well, um, if they just hold the market, let's sort of like for, for argument's sake, so say that they're under the direct share very low. So let's say that they're close to holding the market. Their 
not that influential in settings of the the, the cross section of, of prices, um, but they do lower the elasticity of the market as a whole. And so it goes back to this argument where like the overall elasticity of the market is the, is the valuated average across all the investors. Now, if you're a pure index fund, the elasticity that you provide to the market is zero. Because if like if, if, if GameStop goes up like by a factor of 10, you just sort of like hold on to it. If you're pure market in market in market weighted investor. And so as a result, sort of like 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 if you move money from the active to passive funds, um, um, like or or to like the bank, like it's gonna sort of like 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 make things potentially more uh more inelastic. Um, but that in terms of like how much their own sort of like flows are gonna move like like the cross section of prices, the answer is going to be very little. Uh, and that goes back to the to this the conversation we had, like for instance, in 2008, they just scaled down all stocks in proportion to to the market cap. And that's gonna have like a pretty even effect on prices. Finally, and I think really driving home the point in the accompanying video on my YouTube channel, we asked Ralph if index funds are distorting market prices and making markets less efficient. So it's 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 not obvious. Yeah, so it's it's not very obvious to me. Like in the sense of like like um um in terms of like an impact on elasticity, um, um, I think there um, there are some evidence that 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 they may have. Um, in terms of like directly distorting prices and making markets like less efficient or something like that, um, from what I know, I think there's there's at least from our calculations, that's not something that we that we see. If you look at sort of like like going back to what we talked about before, if you look at sort of like like where the money came from um, that went to passive investors. And see whether it came from investors who are systematically more or less informed about future fundamentals. Uh, that correlation is like essentially zero, and so <laughs> it's not that systematically. Like it, it, it went sort of like similarly from like like informed and uninformed investors to more passive institutions. And so, so given the absence of that of that correlation, um, at this point, I don't think there's much evidence to that I'm aware of. At least, sort of like maybe there's other evidence I don't know, but based on on that calculation, uh, it's, it's not that obvious to me. Thanks for watching. If you came here from my other channel, it's great to see you over here. A lot of the learning that I do personally and eventually talk about on my other channel happens right here in conversation with Cameron and the many brilliant guests that join us for podcast episodes. If you enjoyed these discussions, there are lots more on the channel with experts in financial economics, human behavior, happiness, and all sorts of other areas relevant to financial decision making. If you haven't already, I hope you can check some of them out.